the very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we begin our discussion, we just want to mention we do have a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider tossing us a buck a month there, but if not, maybe leave us a great review on iTunes. Either way, we appreciate you all. Today, we're going to be hopping into a discussion on Heidegger's The Question Concerning Technology. Admittedly, I don't have a lot of takes on this essay. I found it. How could you necessar- be so obtuse? <laughs> wasn't necessarily like the most difficult thing I've ever read, but it was difficult to really like find any sort of uh, ground, I think, for me. So I might have to just let you uh, bring this forth, reveal it, whatever the fuck. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll bring forth, I'll poetically dwell in this essay. Publication date of the essay is uh, about 1953. So it's later Heidegger. I'm just trying to think of like all the interesting things to like, yeah. which I think along the way, you would know, be, so after the development of the atomic bomb, I think it's probably like a per right, which he does historical reference. note, right? Relative yeah, he, to technology. And yeah, he references the, the atom instrumentality bomb and the hydrogen bomb. He may not mention the hydrogen bomb in this essay, but the, if we think of the timeline of Heidegger, he dies in the early 70s. He gives the famous Der Spiegel interview in the 60s where he's, you know, only a guy can save us now. He talks a little bit about technology there, but a good bit of the S of the interview is carefully curated with Heidegger's help to allow him to speak of his short stint with the Nazi party in what it'd be 1933 to 1934. In any case, so if we just think of like the timeline of Heidegger where this falls in 53, you know, in 1909, he writes his first speech, which is really interesting, which is commemorating a very famous anti-Semite from his area, a famous saint. In 27, he publishes Being in Time, which he's most famous for, right? Right. This is almost... 27 years later in the early 30s for about a year he's the he's the rector at a university i believe in freiburg but i'd have to look that year he as the rector you know he has some speeches that have been saved and translated right where he's that's where he's like most full full full-throatedly national socialist but he's only a rector for a year he's you know it's it's just it's not really interesting to go into, but I'll just say, if you think about the punishment he's given after the Nuremberg and France is like, there were some professors that were, there were, you know, journalists, professors, propagandists who were executed. So Heidegger gets off, let's say mildly with having um, his license to teach or whatever, you know, his He's no longer allowed to teach at university, pretty much indefinitely. And this, I mean, not that we, we need to feel sorry for him or whatever, but he did kind of go into a depression, as one might suspect. But he comes out of it um, a few years later because he has a friend over in the, what, it's like the port town, this kind of famous shipping town at, at Bremen with a, an upper middle class, if you will, of manufacturing giants and and cargo masters and basically you know these are um it's not a typical he's not speaking to the proletariat he's kind of he's speaking to 
these these merchants, these wealthy merchants. Mm-hmm. And he, he had ties to Bremen from a friend, you know, from a decade back. But he's he's trying to get back into the swing of things, if you will. And so this is kind of a an interesting little milieu in 49 when he goes to Bremen to give these lectures, these these series of four lectures titled The Thing in Framing Gestell, right? Which is the main topic of, of this essay. The third lecture is called The Danger which we see towards the end when he's quoting uh, Holderlin and talking right. about the Rhine, yeah, and the Rhine and the saving power. Well, he does mention Holderlin and, and the Rhine, the river, but I think it's from a poem called the Ister, or I don't even remember, but yeah, where the, where the danger is grows the saving power also, or something like that. Right. And then he has a last essay and this is the, turn a phrase that Laura Well will always refer to when talking about Heidegger. It's called the, the turn or the turning, which in the question concerning technology volume, there's an inclusion of that essay translated. I mean, the translation we're using of this essay is by uh, a guy, I think his name's what, Carl? No, not Carl. The last name is Lovett. It. it does a pretty good job at translating Heidegger. There's a whole slew of discussions about how best to translate Heidegger. Yeah, William Lovett is the uh, translator. William Lovett, yeah. So William Lovett translates Heidegger in a certain way that I think tries to stay faithful to Heidegger's exposition to a certain extent, though, to try to get out, to wring out all the drops of Heidegger. There's a way in which it, it actually like has to use more words where German can be much more economical, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that that's why the Bremen lectures that I'm mentioning that go into making this essay, which have been translated by um, Andrew Mitchell, who teaches at Emory, and I got to see him speak, super brilliant guy. He translates Heidegger in, a, in like the opposite way. Instead of this elaborate trying to get out all of the etymological resonance and signifiers, it's very much... I'm not going to say close to the German in in any straightforward sense, because this is Heidegger's German we're talking about, but it definitely tries to economize where instead Lovett is going to do the opposite, right? Where he's, he's not into that whole brevity thing. I think there are merits to both. I think that with Heidegger, my opinion is that for better or worse, even if there is probably a middle ground, I think that it's probably better to err on the side that Lovett goes on. But it's hard, man. You get you got to get into that vibe of reading Heidegger, just like any other thinker, like reading fucking Lacan's uh, sure, Cree yeah. or something, or reading Guattari. I feel like you, you need to be on your fourth coffee and like, and like <laughs> you got to be feeling it. With Heidegger, you know, there's a sense in which he's a master of repetition to the point of almost being monotonous which is what Graham Harmon calls him in, <laughs> in his first book, which is an interesting take on Heidegger where, you know, Graham. Is that tool, claims, tool being or am tool I? Being. Of, yeah, tool being. Yeah. Tool okay, being. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. Which we'll have him on soon in the next couple yeah, of we'll, months, right? We'll have him on. I don't know what we'll, we'll talk about. I'd love to talk to him about Heidegger since last time we, we talked to him about his shit. So I, yeah. I would like well, he, to make him go back and, and talk about Heidegger. I think he, at the time that we spoke with him, he mentioned he was doing an object-oriented ontology-related book about architecture. That could actually be, that sounds kind of interesting, but. Yeah, I mean. We don't have to spend too much. Since since you didn't really like this this (laughs) Heidegger foray, perhaps that's more interesting for you, and that's that's fair. I don't know. know, We'll see. For Graham, you know, Heidegger can be reduced to what he calls tool being which has nothing to do with tools. And so it's, it's, I won't even go into it, but for an un- unorthodox look at uh, Heidegger, take a look at tool being, but I will say that it has the merit of being enjoyable read, whereas lots of Heidegger literature, which I, which I slugged through <laughs> for this talk and perhaps why I'm, I think I'm almost like, you know, playing for time here. My point being, I, I prefer this more, circumlocutious way of translating Heidegger over Andrew Mitchell's attempt to cut straight to the point. Because for me, even if you do that, as Andrew Mitchell does, and even if it seemingly reads clearly, it's almost as though the signifiers don't really stick together. 
And this is why there's a glossary at the end of his translation of these Brahmin lectures. And there's there's a whole apparatus that's involved. It's just not in the middle of the text, right? It's on, it's at the beginning and at the end. So you're doing legwork on on either way. I would rather have it right in front of me on the page. You know, if you got to give me some footnotes, sure. If you got to put some shit in brackets, you got to put the wordplay in brackets to show it. Okay, that's fair because this is, I mean, honestly, reading Heidegger, it's like, he's difficult in German. He's not fun to read in German, so I don't try to. I enjoy reading like Nietzsche in German, even if I have to struggle through it. I think it's fun to read, but some thinkers just don't do it. But I, I think that the Lovitz translation is 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 generally decent, and at least it represents a kind of fidelity to what's going on in the essay. And I only mention that because you know, in the technology essay, as in most of Heidegger, there's there's a lot of subtle wordplay that's going on that can be easy to to miss, even with the translator going out of his way to to provide all this stuff. So in any case, so he gives these lectures in 49 and that gets him back, you know, back in the saddle again, back in the saddle publishing reading. And that provides, I think it's in 52, but it could have been an early 53 where he basically combines all of this and gives this lecture, the question concerning technology in Munich, which was attended by a number of luminaries like uh, Ortega y Gasset was there, for example. So was Heisenberg, who he mentions twice in this essay, right? And, you know, we got like a standing ovation, you know, at the, at the end of the, at the lecture, if we believe the biographer, which I, you know, why not? I suppose I do. So basically, this is some of the, the work that he's, um, you know, that he's doing after a kind of hiatus it's some of the first post-war shit that's part of the context the only other context i would give would be that before this and i think it's important because i do think it's it's throughout the essay yet never brought up at the end of the 30s and the very beginning of the the 40s he is doing his nietzsche lectures which have all been collected it's four volumes I think in English, they may be, they may publish volume one and two together and volume three and four together, but technically four volumes of these, these lectures. And so some of the last things he was doing before, before the end of World War II, before this, this hiatus, as I said, he's reflecting on Nietzsche. And I do feel like those reflections shine throughout the essay, not just in the substance of this question of standing reserve gestell you know in framing or whatnot sort of one of the, the last onto theology the end of metaphysics with nietzsche right uh, this this final phase uh that leads into you know modern metaphysics or whatnot but especially at the end of the essay where heidegger who maybe anticipates with the holderlin that we brought up makes this interesting segue to this question of the work of art and perhaps the work of art has something in league with the saving power that he mentions and i think that a lot of people who may have never even read any nietzsche they may have heard obviously they've, they've probably heard you know god is dead whatever which is taken out of context or not whatever they, they've probably heard that but they, I, but sometimes i will meet people who have never read nietzsche that, that will know about the justification of existence is to be aesthetic, right? It's if there is a justification, it's an aesthetic justification. And Heidegger uh, kind of makes an allusion to this to a certain extent, but he also puts in question marks this phrase of aesthetics because he feels like that's kind of almost uh, antithetical to the ancient view of art, which was not for him separated from techne right right yeah, yeah. poiesis and techne are, are hand in hand techne is not only a way of knowing but a way of bringing forth is in concert with revealing and so the arts were not separated as we might think of today from 
all right. things. Yeah, because they're like the relationship being like the craftsmanship of the work of art, right? There's a specific, I don't know. Yeah. I want to say like algorithm as a shortcut, right? But there's like a series of practices <clears throat> in a way that, and you're still using sort of a certain technology, right? Like if you want to consider language perhaps as a sort of form of, te of a technology and bringing yeah. forth the whatever the <laughs> the aesthetic the very fact of if we want to be if we want to avoid high degrees or going into greek etymology or whatever the very fact of creation bringing something forth so to speak out of nothing right and i think that that is why where heidegger is trying to go by and again I, it's funny that I'm starting at the end of the essay and not the beginning, but sure, why not? That this link between art or this 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 shift to art as potentially holding the means for harnessing the saving power and allowing us to potentially take a step back from the all-encompassing essence of modern technology and framing that's going to order and turn everything into standing reserve blah 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 which we'll get into i'm sure that art would hold this except that he he thinks that it, it can't be through an aesthetic mode where art is something merely appreciable because then if you think about it then we're really still talking about commodities we're still talking about instrumentality even if it is just merely for for pleasure mm -hmm. right for human consumption i mean that's an pleasure. end that's a sort of end at, at the end of the day not to pun I do think that Heidegger is using aesthetic in a very restricted sense. Obviously, we could. We I mean, could that goes to causality. We could expand too, it. Right. Which might be some good fodder. What, what, what goes to causality? Just the bringing forth or like the ends of the work of art, let's say. Right. What's funny, though, is that for Heidegger, it's not our aesthetic appreciation. I'm going to use I'm going to speak like Heidegger. <laughs> and again, I've already I've already said I think he uses aesthetic very maybe unfairly, confusing. but it's like, well, I don't know if it's confusing. I just think it's restricted, right? It's like art isn't merely to be appreciated aesthetic. I think that's what he means in the loose sense. We can almost think about there's something of this tension between the, um, the beautiful and the sublime and Kant or something like that, right? Where it's almost like art needs to be, we might say, if we were yeah. to speak with Kant, you know, in, in Kantian terms, where art is needs to be sublime. And I'm not even going to say beautiful because it's a total, it's a obviously a, a bigger tension, but it's like right. it's not merely supposed to bring us pleasure. Yeah. There's there's actually a sense of displeasure in the sublime. It unseats us from our settled everydayness. Yeah. There's some more, there's some more high degrees for you. I would even just quickly say that maybe, maybe the distinction between artist and artisan. Those aren't exactly equivalent. I think an artist could be considered an artisan, but I think artisan is more expansive. And someone who develops a technology, artisan is a broader umbrella, perhaps, than artists specifically. What do you well, think? Well, I mean, that? Today, today it is. Today there are these distinctions. I think Heidegger is trying to say back in the day, back in ancient Greece, which he is privileging obviously artist and artisan would be those would just be um all a part of the same family it, it would still all be under techne i think that for him it's because as i kind of mentioned briefly but i'll, I'll say it again because techne is a mode of revealing right which he is translating poiesis literally for right it's bringing forth it is a revealing an unconcealment blah 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 all the heidegger terms so it is a mode of bringing forth truth. That's the distinction he's trying to make between aesthetically appreciating art and art being a means through which truth reveals itself and can be a part of the destiny of being, blah, 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 right? I think that for, for Heidegger, this is the danger inherent in the essence of modern technology in that in framing can potentially become so widespread and so all-encompassing 
that it can block those modes of revealing that aren't standing reserve and framing, right? That aren't optimization, instrumentality. Mm -hmm. We can think of more and more synonyms. We can just look at, it's very easy to go from this essay to critique of capitalism. And Heidegger slips into that a couple of times, not just in the critique of instrumentality, but you know, he's critiquing again Holderlin. That's his poet in this in this essay. Holderlin at the Rhine writing his poem of the same name versus the hydroelectric dam that's installed as though the Rhine is only now useful for the dam to function. And if we are to try to appreciate the Rhine like the uh, the German poet, then we go on a little a tourist group. We take a vacation. We become a tourist. So I like she draws a certain equivalence to as a form of standing reserve as well. Outside yeah. of just the power generation, there's a certain equivalency between the commodification of. You're right. It's another form of commodification. Exactly. Bringing uh, forth it, the river as the commodity, as the standing reserve or something like that. I don't know. Instead of the Rhine being this quasi mystical location that inspires a poetic truth, allowing us to poetically dwell, right? Is because that's another Holderlin quote he has is man poetically dwells on the earth or poetically man dwells on the earth. I think is how Lovett translates it or how maybe his, uh, in any case. So instead of allowing the, the river to like, presence itself come you know come to presence and reveal itself in its mode of truth for humans beyond all consumption and instrumentality etc letting us kind of commune with some sort of mystical uh connection to this bygone mode of revealing we go to the rhine for a little pleasure tour right for a picnic or whatever again one could obviously devil's advocate and push back and say that is there not a way to commune in this in this way that Holderlin did I think that's true but I think his point being is that that now is instead of being a kind of easy access to everyone it's the rarity it's going to be the rare event to happen rather than as you said just being another commodity to sell I mean, this might be too, draw us too far afield, but I'll just bring it up anyways. What do you think about Badiou and his truth procedures relative to this revealing? Or I'm glad you asked about Badiou because I, I had thought about rereading some, some of Badiou's stuff on Heidegger. You know, for Badiou, Heidegger is, as he says, upfront being an event, Heidegger's, you know, the last great philosopher the great philosopher of the 20th century. That's basically what it says. But whose problem with Heidegger is that the truth procedures or truth as a whole, if you will, for Heidegger to speak like Heidegger is overcoded or what Badu would say sutured to the poem. So to a certain extent, and this is later Heidegger, I think, is what Badu is meaning because you wouldn't find this in being an event. That would be a, a different question. And that would be, one could even say, it's where phenomenology is trying to ground the sciences. And so philosophy has this chauvinistic type of hierarchical relation, but that's not really Badu's thing. Badu is looking at the four truth procedures, right? Art, love, science, and politics, and seeing how Heidegger seems to privilege. And this was my critique of Badu as well, to a certain extent, when he privileges in art, the poem seemingly more than for example, Bacon's paintings, like we talked about with Liz. But in any case, with Badu, Heidegger seems to be doing something to a certain extent that the poem becomes the privileged, if not primary access to ways of revealing truth. And so it becomes, it becomes the stand-in for all the other procedures and seems to dominate them. That's not too unfair of a critique you know heidegger's relation to science is, is a bit strange if we're not talking about epistemology which is a philosophical approach and concept 
and genre of philosophy, if, if we talk about the sciences, it does seem like Heidegger is a bit, even in this essay, right? He's a bit wary of, of the sciences and their means of participating in the modern ess essence of technology. They look into nature for forces to be calculable and nature now can't appear as the jug in front of us, right? Which he meditates on in the thing. The thing is gone. We're left without these objects, which are in German, Gegenstand. We're left without the Gegenstand. Now we got the Buschstand. We've got the standing reserve of energy to be tapped and ordered and converted and distributed and yada, yada. But it's to be called upon. This is part of that language of we no longer sort of in this relationship with um, nature that allows it to appear. We kind of challenge it forth. This kind of talk that he's, he's discussing. In any case, yeah, I think that the Badu would, two things, at least in this essay, one, he would question the role of poetry, not just in the sense that I mentioned, or art itself, but specifically the poem as the kind of overcoding dominant form of truth and its appearance. But he would also, I think, question Heidegger's semi what do we call this, the saving power, which he derives from the poem, which he derives from Hodel. What do we, what do we, what do, what do we do with this salve, you know, salvation-esque, this, uh, the salvatory, you know, discussion of technology in its essence threatens our ability to access this more primordial form of the revealing of truth in poiesis, blah, blah, blah. Yet at the same time, insofar as that danger threatens our, our very essence and the very revealing of truth, if not truth itself, even though it is one of the ways of revealing of truth and of being, but it conceals itself at the same time, yet that threat somehow increases the danger or the danger increases our, our, our possibility of salvation. I think Badu would be very much a bit wary about this type of discussion of whether it be a, only God could save us now or whether it be like only a new relationship to art that's actually an ancient relationship to art, right? That's always Heidegger. Like the new to come is always this, this step back into this primordial past, even if it's not necessarily infused with the kind of nostalgia that we might assume he would have but there's still this this thing about isn't there this more primordial opening of of truth and revealing that technology is is hiding but it's only through technology that we can get there see i think the heidegger's right that you have to go through technology you can't just demonize it he's not a luddite in any in any sense like that even if he may have practiced that somewhat in living in his little hut in the black forest sure but here in this essay, he's not necessarily kind of, there's no, there's no straightforward Ludditism. The straightest way out is through. Well, what do you think about his, doesn't he take a stance against this con idea that technology itself is neutral, which I think is, would be like the sort of marks in, I mean, even Deleuze and Guattari, right? Or they're asserting that technology is a, a neutral status. It depends on what we mean by neutral here. I think I think the that term is is a bit strange. The way that Heidegger is saying it is as though technology could be could be good or bad. It depends on how we use it. I think that's what Heidegger means when he says neutral. And so it it's an anthropomorphic or no, anthropocentric evaluation of technology which he makes clearer as the essay goes on and on, especially at the end, that even if obviously technology is, is, is part of man's creation, it's not, the essence of technology is not a creation of man. It is, for him, it is a mode of revealing of being. I think I said this to you about a week ago where it's like, if technology were neutral, this would imply that man could master it for good uses. Isn't that the implication in we make the world, we can make 
the world in a different fashion, right? Yes, except that that's, I think Heidegger, again, this is the other part of it, is that Heidegger, as always, as we'll see, and, and this is part of why he's a bit of a, sometimes a bit frustrating to read, even if Heidegger brings up certain examples of technology, he doesn't mm -hmm. really, he doesn't really care about, about those. He brings up the bomb. He brings up uh, the hydroelectric plant, plant. There is evidence that he went on these tours with these scientists to like understand. But when he's discussing philosophically these mm -hmm. things, those are just mere examples. Those are ontic. Those are beings. And so those are just little parts of, of technology. They're not the essence, right? He wants to ask that ontological, that big, big brain question. So we can't find the essence of technology in anything technological, which is very frustrating. But I think that that's, that's the, the, to your point about making the world or remaking the world, I think that that's a valid point. And that's definitely, it's just the very fact that for Heidegger, the very mode of revealing of truth and being for today is in framing. And if we could somehow master that, then we would be master of being itself ontologically speaking not just any beings but being itself in its manner of revealing which is part and i mean which the world is part and parcel of right the way in which truth reveals itself the way in which being reveals itself so there's almost also kind of a lacanian thing right like to master the essence of technology we would master the the modes of revealing of the contemporary modes of revealing of truth and thereby we would be masters of truth. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's obviously a kind of wet dream, but a fantasy to use non Heideggerian terms here. <laughs> right. So, you know, I think that that's where when Heidegger does bring up examples of these ontic examples, the hydroelectric dam, the atom bomb, the coal mine, I think he has a couple more, but, or we can think back to being in time, the famous uh, hammer. It's never about the, the dam as dam, the mine as mine, the hammer as hammer, right? It's always about what it can reveal about the revealing of truth and its concealment. Um, and I think that that's why it's interesting when he, if we circle all the way back to the beginning of the essay where he's like, because I, I mentioned the anthropocentric approach to technology, which would consider it, for example, it's at its worst for Heidegger when it thinks it's neutral, where it would be a kind of Shakespearean, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, right? It's technology is neither good or bad. It's really, you know, um, it's really about what we do with it. I think that Heidegger might say that's, correct right because the 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 other part and parcel of this is the instrumental view of technology where it is a means of furthering and enhancing means to an end heidegger would be like okay this instrumental view this anthropocentric view yes that's correct but it's not true when we ask about the essence of technology if we stay on the plane of just technical things Perhaps this definition has some merit, but I think for Heidegger, at least the way that he's approaching or the way he's quote unquote questioning, which he calls the piety of thinking, right? The way that Heidegger remains pious, and this gets back to the Badoosh shit that I was talking about. What do we do with Heidegger's piety? The way that Heidegger remains pious is to remain on this level of questioning that he thinks is philosophical, which means ontological. And which means concerned with this question of being. He's still talking about this ontico ontological division and is only interested in the ontic insofar as it can tell us something about the ontological. You brought up Eidos before we started discussing, which he makes a very interesting point in the essay where he compares his uh, coinage of inframing to Eidos. We don't even have to bring that up because it's not that interesting for what we're talking about now. But I think it's it's fascinating that, you know, Plato or Socrates, if you will, when we go down to these these dialogues and these specific examples, we're always trying to get back to the essence. 
right? We're always trying to get back to that, that which participates first and foremost in truth, right? If we think about the claimants to the thing under discussion, the claimants to that specific idea, first and foremost is the idea participating in itself. We're always trying to get back to that ontological realm. And so I think that that's why Heidegger can be so fucking frustrating. Because for us, I think when we talk about these things, it's easy to slip into wanting to discuss technology as technology. So wanting to discuss computers and wanting to discuss what we're doing right now on Zoom and all the machines that make what we do possible right here and right now. And that has an interest. I just think that's not the question Heidegger is asking after. And so I'll stop after saying this one thing, because you brought it up, this question about neutrality, you know, for Marx in his terms, I'm not sure if technology is necessarily neutral because it's, it's always already plugged in to the, to R and D, which is about a technology is always already siphoning off a little bit of the surplus value it's going to make into making more technology. So it's already invested into... Well, there's the autopoiesis aspect, right? Or the poesis. Sh or maybe that's autopoiesis. Yeah, in an analogy, we could say that. It, I don't know if I... That one's tough because autopoiesis in, in the sense in which um, perhaps Guattari would, would use the term. Maybe not... In, I just, the way that, in the way that I might have this backwards, so correct me if I'm wrong, but he talks about how technology precedes science or like that. And then this also th combined with that, this discussion that the essence te of technology, technology is not applied science or some shit like that. These technologies of measurement sort of have to come first. They have to precede. I don't know, the practice of no, sci it, of science or something like that. I know I know the part in the essay that you're talking about, but it's not quite what he's saying. Okay. So his main point, if I can be quick, if modern science, which we could say inaugurated with Galileo and the mathematization of nature, something like that, right? 17th century. If it proceeds and makes possible the technologies the modern technologies that we associate with the end of the 18th. Well, like century, writing for writing, century. writing is the first technology that makes any of this shit possible. Like it's the grounding for technology, right? The archive of writing that allows us to accumulate knowledge, which allows us to develop tools and technology. That's interesting. I mean, that's, I mean, Derrida will even make writing prior to, to speech, right? So yes. Deference and, and all of that. I, I totally agree with you. I think Heidegger's point is mainly that if we chronologically think that modern physics makes possible modern right. technology. Now, if we're going which like, makes sense, which makes sense, like I think Noctroglycite sort of in that sort of way, there's an interesting maybe. Yeah, there is a for Heidegger, there's a Noctroglycite in the fact that the essence of modern technology, the era of metaphysics in which we are existing in under in framing as his hypothesis mm -hmm. precedes modern physics so again it's not the technological apparatuses that we associate with like the steam engine which would obviously chronologically come after galileo and the mathematical developments that we associate with that He's not very good when he makes this point, but it's a good point that you brought up because I do think that. I mean, to me, this is one of the it, most fascinating things in the essay was that's just like a question that I think gets glossed over. You know, no one talks about no one considers this that I'm this is not something you ever hear about. I think that for for Heidegger, we are always late to the game when we are seeing a let's say a new mode of revelation of truth and i think that part of it is not just man it's not just an epistemological thing it's not just an ignorance thing it's also on the side of of being and this is why i think for heidegger man is not fully responsible for in framing as the modern essence of technology even if man is the author of of technological creations which is obvious 
the essence of technology is not something man-made for Heidegger. And that's one of the things that in framing specifically, as opposed to say ancient Greek poiesis and techne. Is this some sort of vitalism, the essence of technology? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You don't think so. Okay. Not quite how I, because, because to a certain extent, I mean, Heidegger isn't really, again, interested in the organic substrate, right? It, It could be, I mean, I think that that's the thing, right? Where it would only be maybe vitalism in the most abstract sense, but I, I just, it's not about, I think for Heidegger, it's the very fact that there is, you said it, there is a Nocturgli hype. There is an aftermath. We're living in the aftermath of enframing, but it precedes us by a long way. And it's only with a kind of, it's only with the fact that technology in general, again, on an ontic level, has become so widespread and we can see the way in which ontologically the standing reserve is sort of around us everywhere right he gives the example of the lumberjack out in the forest you know his grandfather might have gone out or his great 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 grandfather might have gone out and cut down what he needed for his log cabin but the lumberjack today going out there is is already thinking in terms of profit right, is already thinking about the forest in terms of grist for the mill to make the paper, right. to make the, the the propaganda in the newspaper, blah, 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 right? That's Heidegger's, again, kind of cynical example, which he usually gives cynical examples. <laughs> um, but, and this is part of that dialectic of the saving power and danger. It's only when we're sort of like knee deep in the shit of technology that we can infer and realize that it's been with us for a long time. The owl uh, Minerva. The essence of it. Gone, the right? essence of it. Yeah, exactly. The owl. That's another way of putting it, which is not tragically good, right? That there's this aftermath. We can think about it as a, you know, secondary repression and primal repression. The primal repression of, of modern technology well precedes modern physics. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that I brought up Nietzsche earlier because I think that that for Heidegger, it's important. I like to think it's important that. Uh, you know, what Heidegger might think of as Nietzsche's onto theology of, let's just say, re- thinking of the being of beings as a play of, of cosmic forces, of cosmological, psychical, whatever, eternal return, will to power, blah, 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 right? That, for Heidegger, I think, is what inspired his way of think- thinking of, of Bastan. When I read him talking about Bastan as this, like, you know, field of forces that have been ordered and calculated in such a way that they be called on at any moment. I think he's he's kind of thinking of Nietzsche in his way of reading Nietzsche as as the the last metaphysician. You know, for him, the the last metaphysician, obviously prior to him, that's that sort of ushered in a new way of thinking about the the relation between beings and being. So and this I think is why that, I asked about vitalism, because that's what to me as a, you know, a novice metaphysician <laughs> to be a bit tongue in cheek. But that's I mean, it, why I kind of it, I don't know. It, is vitalism merely just thinking of of a kind of I mean, to a certain extent, Heidegger is is trying, to, even if he's not. Well, like, I don't know, well, reducing the universe to like its own autopoetic creative impulse. See, I don't think Heidegger is. I don't I don't think he's 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 on he's on that that plane though. I don't think that's how he's at least in this essay he's not presenting it that way. Yeah. Right. Like history or not history. Well, I suppose you could even say history drags humanity along. Like humanity really doesn't grasp. He says humanity can never really fully instrumentalize technology and master the world. There's always a surplus sort of that we can't access. So in that sense, it's like history or the universe is the the thing that propels itself. And we're sort of along, we're sort of passengers that have a certain agency, but we are not, we are not God. We don't, the primary contradiction of omnipotence and omnipresence. I would just say that this is, um, (laughs) this is not, 
I think I think that for Heidegger, we can leave that as a sidebar if we have to. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, for Heidegger, I don't think he would see the reduction of the world or even the cosmos to potentially a standing reserve of energy forces to be a vitalism, except in the sense in which we might think of vitalism if we critique it as a narcissism, right? Because when he he's trying to think about how man is more originally implicated in framing than anything else. And obviously that harbors the threat, which isn't the danger that he talks about, but there's a threat that obviously man can be reduced to, to standing reserve. But Heidegger doesn't think that that's necessarily possible based on the essence of Dasein, except that it is a possibility, if not, if of individual humans, which obviously we can look to sci-fi for, for these kinds of takes. But the main thing being is that, um, you know, for Heidegger, it's more of a question of an anthropocentrism. Again, back to this opening of the essay with the instrumental view of nature, quote unquote, as a whole, right? Of phusis, which he would want to say instead of nature, of the unfolding of being, right? The unconcealment of being, to turn that into, to an energy source to be tapped isn't necessarily vitalist in any real sense. It's it's kind of, it's almost more, well, I would say it's almost more death drive, but again, we're, we're kind of getting, we're getting off here. I think the main point is that it's, uh, it's an anthropocentric narcissistic way of viewing nature, because again, it's, it's always about optimizing, maximizing, whether it be profits or, extraction surplus it's not necessarily we could say that the underlying thesis could be a vitalism of sorts but that's not quite what heidegger is is concerned with right that's not the way that he questions i'll say he's thinking about this way in which we since we've only come to it late this understanding of the essence of technology as this omnipresent ordering First of all, it's ordering man to sort of challenge forth nature and or phusis or whatever and order it as the standing reserve to be tapped into, right? In this endless equation of energy and information to be exploited. And I think it's there that Heidegger is considering us to uh, potentially lose, if not part of our humanity, then at least part of what truth brings to our humanity, which I think, I think for Badu, for example, we would be reduced to just the sort of the dying animal without truth. I think that's where he's also kind of close to Heidegger here is because if in framing can completely wipe out or block out the revelation of, of truth in other ways than through in framing itself, which is again, as I said, a way of revealing of truth of beings then we end up with a what he's thinking of as a destiny, right? Because the different eras of the re revelation of truth are these destinies that send man along in order to sort of, if you will, coexist with truth and bring it a, and help to sort of like, let's say, live in a way that is poetic in all senses of the word. If we lose sight of those alternate ways then technology goes from being a destiny to being a fate. And then it does seem like we are um, kind of condemned to this dystopian nightmare. I would say that um, this is where Heidegger's difficult, man, because it does seem like with his pessimism at times or with his cynicism at the very least, that he would conflate, he would think of technology as this, this fate we're doomed to. And this is why I think he turns to art at the end. Art, and I think sublime art, art that isn't necessarily merely titillating, but has an aspect of truth to it. Yeah. And has a way of revealing truth or allowing access to truth that can't be blocked by and framing the essence of technology. I think there, that's where Heidegger thinks we'll, we'll be saved. It's kind of interesting in dialogue with the butlerian jihad but not only the butlerian jihad technology is not necessarily negated fully because the instrumental 
practices of the Bene Gesserit, et cetera, like their own sort of organic methodology for this instrumentality replaces the quote unquote technologic, like whatever draws a distinction between those two. But interestingly enough, in the later books, a Van Gogh painting from Earth still persists. So I don't know. There's, I don't know. I just thought that was kind of cool relative yeah, I mean, to if, this if, discussion. If you wanted but to, that'd be a whole other. Well, I was going to say, if I mean, like, if you wanted to end on a short discussion of Dune and the question no, of we don't have technology, to, we don't have to go too far into that, but that just came to mind. I, I was just thinking, I mean, you, you started to cook there. So I was trying to think <laughs> like, like we would have to, for the, for the listener who may not be a, a yeah, yeah, a it's, Dune it's too much. Fan. Okay. The Bene Gesserit obviously opens up, but I was just thinking, I mean, with the Butlerian Jihad, the way that which is the prehistory, if you will, of the Dune books of the first right. Dune, right? And for the for the listener, if I and it, since I'm not an expert, I'm throwing this to you because it's interesting for a second, and maybe we can because I, I feel like I've said most. Of I what mean, I to say with 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 the Heidegger essay. Now, hope, hopefully, I got something out of of what Heidegger is trying to do. But with the Butlerian Jihad, there's a turn against what machines, computers. Right. Ways of storing information to go back to your 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 kind of uh, writing as technology reference earlier. There's a kind of revolt against the. Let's just say the, the increasing what, if not domination and subservience of human ability, all of our resources, all our capacity seem to be more and more offloaded onto computers, not just the storages of information, but means of planning calculating problem solving is this is this part of what goes into this revolt against thinking machines well i think it's really more of this almost like nietzschean thing of like technology makes life too easy that we get lazy we get complacent with ourselves and like there's no yeah impetus for the human to be challenged and and grow or something like by the difficulties that we face the problematics that we face if we rely on mach this machinery, then we become, then we do become this instrumental, like standing reserve for it. And then technology has its right. own kind of, right. And then technology itself is in the driver's seat, period. So I think it's more of that than AI takeover in the yeah. way that most people fear it. It's more like it renders us, uh, like, I don't know, it kind of destroys our creative impulse or some shit like that but i mean you make a good point uh we can think about the way that heidegger ends the essay on art or with art to we can think about chat gpt and the various image creations from ai programs as again being a part of of the domineering essence of technology is blocking off those alternate or really i mean for heidegger it's not even alternate modes it's this more primordial mode right because again there's that weird greek fetishization nostalgia that's its own thing but but that those would be alternate ways at least of blocking our means back to this more primordial access to true through art yeah yeah i think but, that's right but i but i guess i see a little bit maybe what you were talking about with the vitalism in the context of dune and the butlerian jihad against this very concerted surgical ludditeism against technology in the way in which it the vitalist thrust of almost like the human species rising yeah, up against right. against what would if not oppress it ontically then like genetically right ontologically repress or reduce or lessen human essence that's that's the vitalism maybe that you were thinking of yeah perhaps because i think maybe the <coughs> link would be the way that uh the reliance on artificial intelligence then thinking would sort of be eternally deferred if that makes sense then man's essence as a thinking being or whatever kind of drawing that on my ass but no, that's how to get it gets negated, yeah. right? Yeah, because it's offloaded onto the like the responsibility for thinking is what that's the danger, perhaps. I don't know. 
Yeah, Heidegger is famously like when he's meditating and he's thinking about thinking, he's like, he's like, the problem is we are not yet thinking. And and I think that the that Herbert's take on the the prehistory of Dune with the Butlerian jihad and the rise against the AI machines is like, if we don't, if not, we will not think again. We were not yet thinking and we will not yet think. So there has to be some sort of critical intervention. And there is a almost a kind of uh totem and taboo, like there is oh, there is a there seems to be like an erection of oh I said erection. <laughs> there seems to be a a sort of I'm not sure the the status of the laws, but there is an there is a kind of maybe there's a legal procedure, but maybe it's just unwritten law of outlawing thinking machines, right? Which then spurs this hyper active training of the human mind to replicate and replace what we had lost with the outlawing of thinking machines, computers, right. yeah, yeah, AI, yeah. Yeah. right? So there is exactly. this hyper training, which I think is what you were thinking of with the Benny Gesserits. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Or even the Mentats as well, right? And the Mentats obviously is, but the Benny Gesserits are just a, a sort of, they're just a step to the left. Of, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. And a jump to the right. Put your hands on your hips. But yeah, okay, so I, I think that that makes sense to me. And um, you kill the father, the primordial father, the primordial technological father, and you internalize in this kind of super egoic impulse drive. You resurrect it, but sort of internally, you internalize that. And now no one can hoard the machines anymore, right? They got to be shared out until until the baron or something like that even though you still have the emperor but that's that's going too too far, yeah. far afield but i do right. i do see now what what you were thinking of and using dune as a lens to kind of think through this yeah i mean i i think that that's that's a good um that is definitely a lot a lot more we could do with that obviously we wouldn't necessarily want to stay just with this essay but helping to think through this essay with that point is yeah It'd be really interesting to look into like the specific. I'd have to go dig through the passages about the Van Gogh painting because that seems like a weird thing to include. Right. Like, right. What is it about the Van Gogh painting that persists all these thousands of years later? Or you and just still maintains just, a certain significance? Like more generally, what's the status of art in, you know, whether it be on Arrakis or just a post? what is the status of art in the Dune universe in the narrative? I mean, like, for example, and I'm not sure if I remember this in the book, but I'm, I'm probably sure there's some reference to it that you would know. But if you remember in the Villeneuve Dune, which I know we're getting the second installment soon, but very early on when they land on Arrakis, it may be Paul who, or it could have been, could have been Leto. Maybe it is Leto who, who sees one of the tree tenders. Yeah. And that's he, in the book or in the he, movie specifically and i don't he, think that's in the book then i'm cheating but i'm gonna i'm gonna consider it canon i think the point still the relevant, point stands so. though that like there is something not just of obviously the artistic if you will maybe this but, is the but, sublime but of the, there's sort something of? of this there is something of the sacred right there there is something the way that the the trees justification for taking up so much water to exist when that water could go to to humans, for example, it is a kind of lack of utility, if you will. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's not about its utility. It's not about the fruit. It is as though it is. And I think it is considered a kind of sacred being. So the respect, if you will, of, you know, dwelling with these these trees on this desert planet has something of the um, of the saving power, if you will. Yeah. Right. So I think that that's, you know, that's obviously there's all kinds of places we could go from here in terms of the essay off the top of my head. I can think about Bataille and Lacan, their critique of utility. I think I mentioned to you the other day, maybe it was just yesterday. I was like, you know, you said something about jouissance and I'm like, well, you know, jouissance is supposed to be useful, right? It's <laughs> not, it's not expenditure right is what i was thinking of the in um the accursed share 
right? There's a certain sense of expenditure that isn't about usefulness. Which is, I guess that maybe the connection is like the sort of ends, right? Or like the meeting of a, like the poesis of, there's no, it's detached from an ends. It's an end in itself, which is like the, if we think about Kant, when he wants to define rational human beings in terms of morality, he has various ways of doing it. But one of them is, is you're not a means to something else. You're an end in yourself. And so I think that, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. There's a sense in which the, the tree on Arrakis being an end in itself, that starts to open up a little bit to this, this aspect of, of the sacred. And, you know, maybe that's, that would be, this would be my last thing. And I think we can probably stop here, but maybe that's, yeah. that might be, maybe that's not what Badu would, would critique in the piety of thinking, which is again, how the essay ends questioning is the piety of thinking, but maybe it's this question of Heidegger's piety and the saving power in the danger of the essence of technology. I wonder about, I wonder about this question of if he is trying to gesture towards art as a way of delimiting and circumscribing a kind of sacred within the profane. And that is very problematic for modern art because as we know, modern art plays with that opposition just as much. We think about, um, Obviously, your one of your favorites is is Duchamp's Virgin Mary sculpture, but there's also the is it the I'm blanking really badly. You'll have to help me here, but the there's the the crucifix and the in the oh the like piss I think it's, is it Piss Christ? I think they just call it Piss Christ, which sounds like a, a metal band, by the way. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that would be my question back to Heidegger, pushing on this piety question: Is there like the way that Levinas tries to conceive it is there a way of is there a dialectic of the sacred and the holy where there is a secularization of of the one or the other i'm trying to remember if it's the holy I think the sacred is the secularization of the holy but there could still be this way of of a kind of sacred we might even need a new term for it that could persist without resurrecting these nostalgic artificial territories that would reinstantiate a kind of return to traditional values even if we can see that in heidegger's biography at least in this essay he's not quite saying that right for better or worse he doesn't seem to necessarily be saying like we need to go back to we need more people to come to the 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 catholic church or whatever I brought this up to you a couple of weeks ago, but that the silver chalice at the beginning, when he talks about the four causes, that's a reference to his, um, his Catholic upbringing. And as we know, in in Germany, that was, that was a more of a minor denomination. Yeah, right. Yeah. That, since Luther. Right. I think that would take us too far afield, but I, but I do wonder about this question. I, I think that I would have to turn to Levinas and totality and infinity to do justice to this question of what it what is the saving power and how can it how can we talk about it without this kind of theistic aftertaste that would no doubt fall into regional particular religious territorialities right i mean like because if there is a saving power it it needs to be universal again this is what badu's trying to do with saint paul But that's a, that, that's a whole. Tradies, uh, <laughs> that's right, St. Paul <laughs> Trades. Yeah, there you go. That's a whole other conversation. And um, and I will say, like he- Heidegger's essay, rereading it for today because I read it a couple weeks ago when we were planning for this episode. We're reading it for the day. Those were the kind of notes that I was that I was noticing with Heidegger. Is like literally this question concerning technology. One of the frustrating things is Heidegger really isn't giving us answers he has a couple of suggestions towards the end but he's he's like that guy i'm just asking questions right so like i think that's fucking that that is frustrating but we have to ask back i think we do have to ask back and that that's one of my questions to to heidegger is like where and in what does the piety of thinking consist right it doesn't seem to be philosophy it seems to be the 
seems to be the poem. That's the Badu critique again. I think he's pretty spot on, right? It's, it seems to be like we need to capture something of of Holderlin. We need to we need to capture that saving power in the danger. We need to capture that sort of m- mystical setting of the Rhine and the you know in the in the rising of the sun. Or was it the setting of the sun? I read that fucking poem for today, and and <laughs> I forget. Either one. That's that's like the event, I mean, if you will, that transports us to. It's interesting, right? In in the poem, in Holderland's poem of the uh, the Rhine, or no? Well, he wrote about a lot of different rivers, but anyway, you, you get transported to Greece or southern Italy or something like this, and 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 sort of transported back as well to this like more ancient time it has it has a kind of it, it remind I, I think it encapsulates a lot of what heidegger is trying to do right cast our thought back to this ancient greek miracle of philosophy and perhaps reveal the truth in a way that we had lost in the forgetting of the forgetting of the question of being, et cetera. This is partly why I don't really like Heidegger. <laughs> I've tried not to shit on him. I use, I shit on him a lot in a lot of other episodes. I try to be pretty good to him today and not talk too much shit. I resisted <laughs> a little bit, but I, I don't think I, I don't think I disparaged his thinking in ways that I, I can tend to do. Mm-hmm. So that's partly why I, I try to prepare for today. So I wouldn't just, come out talking shit because that's i mean that's that's easy and it's that's blocking up the the way for a you know a, a bringing forth and blah 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 <laughs> and unconcealment <laughs> nice nicely done i was a little bit worried that this wouldn't be that engaging but i really enjoyed what we did today i did too man yeah i did too and um it's an interesting essay i do think reading it the first time is probably going to be like it's it's just going to annoy you. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, I the think, revealing and the concealment and the bringing forth and like all of trying to like mm-hmm. figure out what all of that is doing and learning that is a challenge for sure. Yeah, every time Heidegger says we have been questioning concerning technology or every time Heidegger says in framing is the essence of modern technology, you have to take a shot. <laughs> if you can finish the essay before you're drunk, if you can read it fast enough and your metabolism isn't, isn't too fast. It's a race between your metabol metabolizing the alcohol and, and reading, reading the Heidegger. But yeah, I mean, the second time I read it, I, I was able to step back from forest for the trees kind of shit, right? Like looking black a little forest bit, for the trees. Yeah. The black forest for the trees. That's right. Um, the trees that will be, grist in the mill for the, for the propaganda <laughs> of the newspapers right yeah. that kind of shit i will say reading the bremen lectures i didn't really enjoy them at all and may have partly been the disparity between mitchell's translation and lovett's there are differences that i brought up earlier but there's also i mean the the gestell essay in particular right early on he makes his one I think in the essay is actually two, but he makes this one. He makes this one like acknowledgement of the uh, the horrors of the Holocaust, and he does it in such a flippant way. He basically says that like agro business yielding, you know, the standing reserve of crops is the same as producing bodies for the gas chamber. He just makes this this flippant reductive out of nowhere remark it's hard to place right is it like is that his one way of like acknowledging i don't know it's not enough and it's obviously it obviously seems in very bad taste but there's a reason for his way of doing it and it doesn't seem to be his intention to diminish but it comes across that way Mm -hmm. one can only think of what the crowd in 1949 bremen would have reacted you know post-war his mention of it in 49 like would that have been something evocative or provocative 
or would it have been more of an acknowledgement at the time? And so he's trying to say, like, look, the shit we, we, we realize we did, that's just another part of, of the essence of technology. But reading it this far removed, mm-hmm. not in that 1949 setting, it feels in really bad taste. Especially from what we know more and more now about Heidegger's um, own associations, if you will. If I'm being, I'm being very loose here with, <laughs> with Nazism. I mean, right. we, we, we know... There's more, obviously, that, that could be talked on that subject, but I, I thought I would just, I think, for the most part, just acknowledging that that's, that's a part of it. That's was Right, yeah. You could do a whole, we do a whole series for sure. of episodes right. on his Nazism, and there was that most recent, was it, was it Richard Wallen who wrote, was it earlier this year? It was just published? Yeah, I think you're right. It's more, about the, more about Heidegger's quote-unquote black notebooks, which more probably cast Heidegger in a, much more definitively bad light i'd be interesting to read that but you know it's all a question of degree right it's not a question of yes or no i mean it, there's yes it's like when 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 deleuze says in the dialogues with claire parnay is like when he was taught he's like we're one of the last generations to learn the history of philosophy we we're we we're beaten over the head with it we were bludgeoned with it uh i think the the word he actually says is assassinated in French. We were we were like mauled, killed with the history of philosophy. And he's like, when he looks at Heidegger, he's like, the question that, you know, for Deleuze isn't, isn't he something of a Nazi? And it's like, obviously. For Deleuze, it's the way in which Heidegger reactivates the history of philosophy. Now, obviously, Deleuze is going to do something different with the history of philosophy than Heidegger. But it's this way of how can the history of philosophy be used in the creation of concepts. So Heidegger is going to go to the history of philosophy in order to, sometimes it seems, and again, this shows his league, his allegiance to the poem. He's going to look at the history of philosophy. And a lot of times he's going to, he's going to really tarry with the etymological roots, but also the developments over time and also expound those in, in, in the German. So there is something too in this essay that I didn't even mention that he's, he's doing something poetic in this essay. It doesn't come across that well in English, but when he talks about Gestell throughout the essay, he's playing off of these different, there's like, I noticed maybe 12 different Stell verbs and nouns and that we, we could have talked about, we could have spent a whole episode on, but it's, it's real. That's really not, that's a totally different episode, and it's not really about philosophy, but that's part of the the poetic frame, right? To that he's trying to do, and I think Deleuze is it takes a totally opposite tack. You know, if he makes if there is any sort of etymological play in Deleuze's works, it's it's never front and center, and it's always it's almost like a throwaway, right? Because it's it's that's the thing. It's that's not that for Deleuze, I think is not how um, one creates concepts. That almost seems a substitute for it. Again, yeah, I, I right. said I wouldn't really talk shit about it, <laughs> but, but hey, I'm just, but I'll leave it at that. I think we can wrap up there. Thank everyone for joining us on another edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Chair and Taylor Atkins. We'll see you all next week. Happy New Year! The very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity. Including the ultimate form of security, which is a cat. 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 state of things. A cure of violence without object of hell. This is a typical violence of default. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real. The vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, Lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.